So I'd like to welcome you to this uh, event arranged tonight by the Joint School Field Trust. Um, and I hope that many of you are joining us for the first time. Uh, if you are and you've come along to pick up some hints as to how to apply to our um, uh, mentoring scheme uh, application round, which is currently open, then uh, you've come to the right place and you'll also find on our YouTube channel um, a very helpful webinar which we recorded a few weeks ago uh, on the best way to tackle our application form. Um, and if you uh, uh, are not uh, considering doing that, um, then and, but you do know uh, any other journalists who might be interested, please do pass our details on to them. The application round remains open until the end of September. Um, in a moment, I'm going to introduce you to uh, our host tonight, Martha Kellner, but if I can press the buttons correctly, I want to share my screen with you um, because one of the things that it's useful to know about the Trust is that uh, all of our guests for the R Masterclasses uh, give their time for free and the Trust tries to run all its events without charging. Um, but if you are in a position to make uh, any donation, small or large, to the Trust, then on your screen at the moment, I hope, um, is a QR code which will allow you to snap it with your phone and make a small donation. Um, whether it's £5 or £10, anything you can afford, uh, would be extremely welcome to us as we continue to do our work uh, to uh, encourage the next generation of young journalists and to help to diversify the newsrooms uh, of, the, of the UK. Um, but I'm going to introduce you now, I'm going to stop sharing that screen, I'm going to introduce you now to Martha Kellner, who is our host for this evening, who will introduce our guests for this fantastic masterclass on how to present a news programme. Thanks very much, Martha. Thank you very much, David. Yeah, I'm the US correspondent for Sky News. Um, coming to you from Austin, Texas, where I'm reporting on um, the US's ever restrictive laws on abortion. Um, but very, very excited to be hosting this masterclass on presenting. Um, we've got an absolutely outstanding panel of speakers. They don't actually require much introduction. They're three women at the very, very top of their game. Um, but just to give you a reminder of who they are and their, their careers. Um, first up, we've got Kathy Newman, one of the main presenters of Channel 4 News, now also a presenter on Times Radio. She joined Channel 4 News in 2006 and was the first female main presenter of the programme. During her time at Channel 4 News, she's broadcast a string of incredibly important scoops. They include an investigation into the British sex offender Simon Harris, which saw him jailed for 17 years. Previously to working um, in television, Cathy spent over a decade working in Fleet Street, latterly with the Financial Times. She's also written two outstanding books, um, the first of which, Bloody Brilliant Women, is about female pioneers in 20th century Britain. So thank you ever so much for joining us, Cathy. Thanks, Martha. Uh, and Great to be here. Thank you. And second up, we have uh, Julie Etchingham. Again, not much introduction required. Um, she's the multi-award winning ITV news presenter, um, famous for her relaxed and accessible style while presenting some of the most um, important TV news bulletins. Um, she's presented, presented apologies from around the world, um, from the inauguration of President Obama the Asian tsunami and the Japanese earthquake. At home, she marshals very effectively general election leaders debates for ITV. She's also twice been named the Royal Television Society's Presenter of the Year, first in 2010, then in 2016. I'm sure she'll give us more details on this, but Julie began her career while still at university, before becoming one of the BBC's trainee reporters. Um, so thank you as well, Julie, for joining us. Pleasure. Great to be with you. Great to be with such bloody brilliant women. <laughs> <laughs> um, and last, but by no means least, we're also hoping to be joined by Naga Monchetti. She's currently You've racing. You've got me. Oh, You've we, got we've me. Got, we've got I'm Naga. Currently, currently driving into Manchester in traffic. I apologise. Oh, well, thank you very, very much for, for making the effort and racing up the motorway um, to get to us. Uh, Naga, of course, one of the most familiar faces on BBC TV and now one of the most familiar voices 
on BBC Radio. Um, she's grilled countless political heavyweights from Hillary Clinton, David Cameron and Tony Blair. Um, also a master of the, the lighter side of TV and radio, with celebrity interviews ranging from Mick Jagger to Benedict Cumberbatch. Naga began her career in newspapers for the City Pages at the Evening Standard and the Observer, and her first job in TV was at Reuters Financial Television. Um, she's also one of my favourite ever Strictly Come Dancing contestants. So thank you very much for joining us, Naga. Martha, you need to watch more of Strictly. <laughs> no, <laughs> thank you. No, like, I, great to be here. Stand by that. Um, so I guess it makes sense. First of all, to, to start off with whether presenting for, for each of you was your aim when you got into journalism, if it was something you naturally gravitated towards and a bit of your route of how, how you got started. So I guess start start with you, Cathy, if you don't mind on that question. Yeah, sure. Um, no, presenting absolutely wasn't in my game plan. I didn't really have a game plan, to be honest. Um, I started off on newspapers, as you said, and I started off actually on a local newspaper called the North Devon Journal. I got a scoop about goats, wild goats being culled and a, uh, on a clifftop path and the police had launched a manhunt because they thought it was a murder and it turned out that the council had um, slain all these wild goats without telling anyone. So that was my first scoop. So I was very much driven by reporting and having done the local newspaper, I then reported, I was told that the way into journalism was to specialise. So I went on to Media Week, which no longer exists anymore. Um, from there, I went to be media business correspondent on the Independent, which only exists online. So I seem to, I seem to have a knack of joining organisations that then... Um, cease to exist. Let's hope Channel 4 is in existence for a very long time. Um, so yeah, so I, after the Independent, I jumped from there to the Financial Times and I was there for about eight years. So that was kind of, I suppose, my most solid grounding in journalism. And it, it was very much, you know, it's very much driven by reporting uh, in, in a very detailed, forensic way on stories. And I did lots of investigations there, which was great fun and sort of got me into that um, side of journalism I think just to sorry backtrack why did I want to be a journalist I, I didn't have a telly when I was growing up until I was about 16 and then I saw Kate Aidy standing up in a flak jacket reporting on the first Gulf War and I was like wow that's amazing and I'd never seen a woman on television doing something as exciting as that um, so I wanted to be a war reporter and that's you know I've never quite made it on that front so um, maybe that's my next job so um after the Financial Times, I, I did sort of bits of punditry on TV and and then got hired by Channel 4 as political correspondent and I'm still here now, but as a presenter. So absolutely had not the slightest idea that I would end up presenting the nightly news when I first set out in journalism. And I think very much the base, the sort of bedrock of everything I do is about journalism and it's about reporting. So I see myself very much in that vein. Hope that answers your question. It does. It's interesting that you say sort of journalism first, and that's the basis also for being a good presenter. Would you agree with that, Julie? I know you started obviously on the BBC trainee reporter scheme. Yes, that's right. And I would, I mean, I'd wholeheartedly agree with that. And whenever, you know, if people are, you know, interested enough to ask, you know, uh, if they want to be get into news presentation, I say, well, you know, just tell that you just, you either want to be a journalist or you don't. And um, I mean, I sort of knew that I wanted to be a journalist from quite a young age. I'd kept a diary from the age of six. And the older I got, the more it became a little slightly sado cutting spile <laughs> with little bits of news uh, paper stuffed in it you know um, and uh, I wasn't from a journalist background my parents are both teachers and it was my mum actually who said you know and I can even remember when she said it you know maybe you ought to think about being a journalist it was one of those little light bulb moments as a child um, and so I just sort of you know I mean I started out um, you know picked up the phone went and worked at my local radio station you know I was an absolute you know classic dog's body in the new newsroom you know making coffee looking after people then eventually getting to have a go at it um, and I kept that going through university as well and then applied for one of the BBC's journalist training schemes and and back then um, 
they were by media so you got trained in radio and tv and i was uh, really fortunate to be picked as birmingham's trainee trainee so i was immediately on this incredible news patch you know sort of the very early 90s there's a lot going on there um and it was a very busy television newsroom so i you know i really cut my teeth as a sub you know i was writing bulletins sometimes i might go out and do an interview for somebody else's package um, then I, you know, bit by bit, I was trusted to do a bit more. And then my boss sent me to Radio Shropshire, <laughs> uh, which really teaches you how to dig up a story. You know, if you're in a rural, reasonably quiet spot, you know, there's nothing that sort of trains you better than to go to a place where the, you know, the stories aren't, you know, falling into your lap like they were in Birmingham. Um, so I had a spell in that too. Um, and then sort of went to news round. It was one of those jobs that I'd never thought I'd ever apply for, but I was 24 and I thought actually that would, I'd never thought about that, but actually, you know, it's got great heritage, that programme, they still cover all the big stories. Um, there was a great, you know, a great advantage in learning to, to sort of uh, unpack complicated stories for kids because actually most of the time that sort of simplicity of writing for television news is is essential you know when we do our jobs day to day now so I always I always started out with a mixture of reporting and slowly started to do a little bit of presenting in the mix and by and large I've I've been very fortunate to keep that going all the way through my career um, I, I went to um, BBC Breakfast News I was their sat van reporter um, uh, sort of embarrassing myself in various locations up and down the country at stupid hours of the morning. Um, and then I started presenting a bit of breakfast news. And then uh, Nick Pollard um, poached me to go to Sky News. And, and, and one of the things that I will say about presenting, and you know, it is just a sort of fact of life, you know, that came at a time in my life when I started my family and it just meant my hours were much more regular and much more predictable, which helped a lot. Um, but what I loved what I really loved about working at Sky was that, you know, if there was a really big breaking story, you'd be chucked out on the road anyway. So you'd be out there working as a reporter and ha having that good mix. And by and large, just sort of fast forwarding through my career, I've, I've always managed to keep that balance. You know, like Cathy, I still report now. I still dig around for my own stories and set my own stuff up. Um, mm -hmm. And the presenting has always been a bit of a sort of icing on the cake, if you like. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very, you're very privileged to do that job. But you know, it, I would, it, I couldn't do that comfortably unless I was reporting and and doing the journalism. Basically, that's the you know base camp of, of what what I do in the same way as Kathy. We've come coming at it from slightly different angles, but yeah. I think we're basically saying the same sort of thing. Yeah, and lots of uh, great TV careers have been launched by Newsround and the, the Grand <laughs> issue as well. Um, Nagra, I'm hoping that you can hear us. I'm hearing everything, don't you worry. And um, just, I, I'm, I'm probably not going to say much that's different to Julie and Cathy, except that I came in from a different route. Um, mm. So I had no idea about what I wanted to do when I was younger didn't have a clue. I studied English at uni because it was the only thing I thought I would be able to do for three years without um, being distracted. Uh, while I was at Leeds Uni, I got involved with the student paper just because I was curious and nosy and I thought it looked like fun. And it was, and it satisfied my generally nosy, curious um, and quite dogged nature. Um, and I then didn't want to get a job. And so I then applied with experience. Um, I'd been doing some work experience at the Observer, Sunday Times, at the Times, um, for a postgrad because I didn't want to go out and get a job. And so I got a very coveted place at City University, postgrad in newspaper journalism, which I kind of loved and I kind of hated. Um, but it taught me to just it taught me discipline and it taught me the joy of finding your own story those off diary moments i don't know if anyone does those where you're just literally sent out to go find a story you're given nothing and you just go and find a story i hated it the first time i did it and then loved it ever since um and so you know like judy like kathy uh i have immense joy in finding the story but from then and i specialized like kathy specialized i specialized in financial news and mm -hmm. economics and um, not personal finance, but financial news. Um, and 
because I enjoyed it and I knew we needed a specialism and also no one wanted to do it. Everyone hates numbers and everyone hates economics and no one really then, when I was doing it, kind of saw the excitement in reporting something that was often so complicated. And for me, the joy was always not simplifying, but making a story accessible and interesting and telling someone, and I still stand by that now, whatever the story, why should someone know about it? Mm -hmm. And how do I make it as interesting as possible? Um, I think Julie was being very polite when um, she said if someone says they want to be a news, a news presenter, be a journalist or don't do it. I can't stand it when someone says, I want to be just like you and be a presenter. I'm not a bloody presenter. I'm a journalist. Mm -hmm. um, and I, if you want to be a presenter, go and go and do adverts or something. Just be a face on telly you know saying stuff that doesn't mean anything to you um to be a presenter was never my ambition but I went up the route I started I went to CNBC Europe and I worked at started as a producer and worked my way up as an exec producer and then very fortunately got poached to various jobs went to Channel 4 News started reporting got poached by Bloomberg went back to my love of financial news um market and then got poached by the BBC as a presenter but um for me, the only reason I kind of started gravitating towards presenting was because I'm a control freak. And I didn't like the fact that the presenters I was producing for weren't doing the interviews as well as I thought I could do them. <laughs> um, and so that's why I did it. And I, when I present, I, I love the fact that I get to interpret the story, but I also have always kind of been very collaborative collaborative um, and make sure that the producers I do work with um, talk to me and tell me how they interpret stories or interviews or reports being told um, because one of the things I do believe as a presenter is that you know I do think we're kind of the icing on the cake because we have a whole load of substance beneath us and research that has been done by teams as well as by us um and that's what that's what as a presenter we do but equally I do get an immense joy in having my own story and telling them my way that's that's brilliant thank you Nagra and I think I think you touch on there which is something that I think all three of you agree on and have a consensus on which is that journalism is at the heart of being a successful news presenter and it's about stories and the people who you're telling those stories to as opposed to just wanting to be a presenter. Um, I should say at, at this juncture that if anyone wants to ask any questions please note them in the, the chat box below and I'll try to get to those questions as well but I think just, just pulling on that thread I think being a presenter is often seen as the most glamorous role in the newsroom. <laughs> um, can, can you, is that accurate and I guess what is the skill set that's needed to be a, a successful news presenter, do you think? Um, again, I'll start with you, Cathy, again. <laughs> I liked Julie's um, wicked laugh. By the way, I'm muting myself when I'm not speaking because my agent just texted me and said there was a lot of background noise because I'm actually in the newsroom now and the news is on. So I should be in the studio, but I'm delighted to be here instead. Um, yeah, the, gla the glamour. I think it's glamorous being an ITV presenter. I think that's fair. I think Julie can tell you about the glamour of that. Um, I mean, I, I think Naga hit the nail on the head there when, when she was saying that there's this whole, you know, the icing on the cake and you've got this amazing team behind you, which is absolutely true. And that's, I, you know, it's a great weight of responsibility that you don't want to let down all these correspondents who've brought in amazing stories. And, you know, maybe you're doing an interview on a key sort of legally contentious story and you don't want to screw it up so you know that that's that's very important skill set for the job um I think one thing you highlighted in your intro to Julie which I think she does amazingly is that ability to be very calm and authoritative um when it's a very stressful situation like in a an election debate um I'm sure Julie will will tell you all about that but yeah absolutely the the swan thing of you can be paddling very hard below the water but what people see is that it's very calm I remember once my first boss at Channel 4 um, Jim said to me you know you don't want the audience to feel either embarrassed or sort of stressed watching you and so that always stuck with me that if 
everything is going to hell in a handcart. You know, I remember once nothing was working in the studio. The cameras weren't working. The auto key wasn't working. And I was really, it was, I was really new to the whole gig of presenting. And I remember I obviously forgot that I had all my scripts printed out. And I just forgot that I had the get out of jail free card of just being able to pick them up and just, you know, read a few things out and don't stop talking. And so I kind of like kept looking around the studio to find a camera that was working and nothing was. And that 10 seconds of live TV felt like an eternity. So obviously now that would never happen to me now, no, never in a million years. Um, but yeah, so another really important skill, if everything goes wrong, you've got to stay calm and just bear in mind that, you know, you have, you have facts and information at your disposal. I've always got a ream of scripts and info in the studio with me because I like to be prepared because the best way to avert disaster is to have a plan B. So I like to have a plan B in the studio. And then the other thing I'd say in terms of skill set for a presenter is just to, to be yourself as much as possible on air, because you don't want to be a kind of like parody version of yourself. Um, yeah, it's slightly heightened being in a studio. You're a slightly sort of maybe more animated or, you know, more engaged version of yourself. But I think to be yourself and that's more relatable for people who are watching they if they kind of see you and go oh she's a normal human being rather than a the the glamorous um vision that perhaps people might traditionally associate with a tv presenter that you know obviously look smart do your makeup wear the right clothes but being a real person and being yourself i think is really important that's brilliant. Sorry, 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 one other one other thing that I mm -hmm. should have said. I mean, this is all sort of tumbled out in no particular order, as would never happen in a, a live bulletin. But obviously, to be incredibly well prepared for so every interview I do, I, I prepare and over prepare and over prepare because you never know when you might need to, you know, someone might die and the program goes open ended. Then you've got to know what you're talking about. Um, so yeah, be absolutely rigorous and think of every sort of different scenario for a complicated, high pressure interview. Julie, can I just get you to pick up on that and that idea of, I know you mentioned before about having, doing your own research, having your own sources, having your own ideas on, on stories. Can you just explain a little bit about how that plays into your role on screen? Uh, yes, I mean, it's it, it, to echo what uh, Cathy said is, you, you know, you don't go, you shouldn't go into a studio um, unless you are completely prepared, if necessary, to keep that programme on air if literally everything else falls down around you. So you need to know what is, you know, you need to know enough detail about every story on your programme so that if something, you know, if a package cuts out in the middle, you know, you know where the thread of that story is and you know you can make sense of it and 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 take your audience with you as you navigate that bit of the programme. But, you know, it is not, it is really not a case um, of just simply reading out a link and waiting for a, for a VT to run and then doing that. You know, it's absolutely not. You're there, um, you know, you are there to share the news of the day with you know your viewer and do that in a personable way um uh, but also you are there really to to mop things up when when stuff goes wrong um and you know i suppose you have to be able to you have to be able to edit quickly in your head for example if suddenly you realize okay that's gone wrong i've got 40 seconds to to fill there what facts to, do i corral in some sort of you know reasonable order that makes sense for an audience and, and and use that time productively so you're constantly sort of shifting and I'm, I'm sure you know Naga and Kathy do this as well but you know whilst I'm on air I've got the computer you know I've got the running order in front of me in a computer in the desk I'm endlessly rewriting things on air as we go quite often um you know, we have a top line message system with our chief writer and uh, the programme editor in the gallery. And we are quite often tinkering with things whilst we're on air, sharpening them up, you know, just rephrasing things. Or if something's broken late, making sure that we get things in uh, quickly and accurately. So you are there. I mean, sometimes almost as a reporter at a desk, if you like, you know, but you've got to have those sort of editing skills uh, to hand as well. But um I mean, I suppose it, it's worth just dwelling for a moment on the fact that, you know, we all three of us don't just do news bulletins. You know, we're in situations where quite often you're doing different types of programmes as well. Um, you know, I've been very fortunate to do you know, things like the Royal Wedding or, you know, I've 
uh, you know, I worked on the Duke of Edinburgh's funeral earlier this year and you're on air for hours. Um, and, you know, the, I mean, the, the preparation that goes into programmes like that, not just from my perspective, but for the whole team, in terms of the, the really deep dive, detailed work that you have to do in terms of just the facts, uh, being able to help your audience navigate what they see unfolding in front of them, getting the tone right, making sure you, you are absolutely across every detail of that story. I mean, that is proper do your homework stuff. There's no way around it. You know, you, you see about a tenth of what this job is when you see yeah. us on air presenting. The rest of it is, you know, get get down, get your head down and get your head around the facts and keep going over them. And really, you know, it's it's sort of deep dive work. I, I mean, I, I absolutely love that side of the job. Um, and although I find, you know, the, those big events incredibly, incredibly nerve wracking and the adrenaline never leaves you, um, mm. the element of it I really, really love is, is the sort of detailed work, you know, and that's why, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great job, really, because you get to do that sort of solitary prep work, but then you also get, you know, the great privilege of sort of taking people through key national and international events. Nigra, I don't know whether you want to pick up on any of what Julian and Cathy were saying, but also another question that, that's come in from Shoma, who's tuning in. Um, she says, how has social media changed your job? And I guess tangentially to that, um, we've also got a, a question from Patrick about, does reporting on so many tough issues take a toll and how do you stay resilient? And I, and I guess something that brings them together is that social media then gives people a, a platform sometimes to engage and to praise what you're doing, but also to criticise what you're doing. And do you think it increasingly takes a, a toll on your mental health, you know, reporting some of these issues and uh, being open to that sort of criticism? Do you want me to move on to social media, Martha, or, or, or what would you prefer? Yeah, if, if, you, don't, if you don't mind yeah. just reflecting yeah. on the social media question, yeah. Yeah, because um, I can just firstly, I completely echo what Kathy and Julie said. I had that thing this morning where our open media system that various systems are used completely crashed while we were on air. So we had no scripts and on radio, it's all done kind of on the fly. So absolutely just to reiterate, always know your stuff. Always know, always know that you know the stories, you're able to tell it. Uh, kind of goes, I suppose, on, sorry, I'm just walking into my fat. Um, it kind of, with social media, people are going to hate and unfortunately social media which is a brilliant tool twitter for example is a brilliant tool in terms of journalism and to find people and keep across what people are speaking about but social media what were the first questions martha the, the first questions well it was from it was just how has social media changed your job and i guess you sort of answer that with the access to sources and yeah, access fantastic sources fantastic hearing conversations that you may not be privy to or kind of seeing how conversations are working out brilliant um um uh, and then the, the other question was how does reporting on tough issues take a toll on you mentally and something I was asking tangentially to that is whether abuse perhaps on social media which most people in the public eye experience on a fairly regular basis if that has an effect on your mental health and perhaps how you're able to deal with that. Second question was how does social media impact how I do my job? That, that was the first question from Shoma oh, which you answered but the, the second question was how how does the net perhaps the negative side of social media oh, okay fine um you learn to get you learn to have a very thick skin um which i've learned i've learned to, i can only speak for myself i think being a woman in the media and on screen means that we receive much more um criticism and misogyny and i'm sure kathy and julie um will pick up on that um i think you have to and it kind of goes back to that when I first started and I probably still have it now that imposter syndrome where you think well I always just wonder if I am good enough so I always make sure I'm overly prepared not overly prepared just as prepared as I can be um so I know that if someone's going to criticize me and say she didn't know what she was talking about I know I, or if an MP for example comes back and says no you've got that wrong I know I haven't um so that's how I think I deal with critics full stop if 
there's nothing to criticize you can dislike me of course you can people you know we don't like everyone um but i uh, i would like to think um that the thing that i'm most proud of i.e being accurate and doing my research isn't something that we criticize and i have to put things in for myself into boxes about what's reasonable um if you're going to criticize me is it a reasonable criticism or are you criticizing something that actually is pointless like you don't like my hair you don't like my voice you don't like the way i sat you don't like the fact that i wasn't um deferential enough to an to a minister um i'm not gonna i can't i have to that's how i handle it in order to protect my mental health mm -hmm. uh, same same question to you julie and kathy and i guess whether women on tv are perhaps held to a higher standard um than than male colleagues and whether they receive a lion's share of perhaps the more personal abuse yeah, I, I mean, definitely agree with what Naga was saying. You have to develop a really thick skin. And actually, the first time that I got um, like a whole array of death threats and, you know, horrible trolling, it, it really floored me. And I've kind of never seen anything like it. And I just felt like I'd been sort of, I felt like I was being torn apart in the street in public and sort of eviscerated publicly. It was just really dehumanizing. And that was quite hard to deal with. But I suppose if there's an upside to that, it's that every time something like that happens, I sort of care less. And I think learning not to care is quite, I genuinely don't spend time worrying about it now. I tweet less than I did, which maybe is a shame, but maybe not, because actually I still think the key thing about my job is making contacts and using my contacts and bringing in stories from my contacts. And Twitter is part of that journalistic piece. I agree with what Naga said about, you know, it's good to reach out to sources and, and to sort of see what's going on and take the pulse of, you know, I think it is a bit of an echo chamber, but you can see what other journalists are reporting on. That's quite useful. Um, but yeah, I just think I've kind of moved I've totally changed my approach to social media and just, I just don't care what some guy with an egg on his head says about me. I just genuinely don't care. And yes, do, um, do, do women get it tougher? Yes, I think so. Definitely. And women of color also. Um, and yeah, and that, that's awful. And I think the online harms bill, which is currently going through parliament, you know, not before time. And I think, you know, I have two daughters and I look at what happens to teenagers on social media and we've had big chats about it. Oh, hi, Naga. Hi, sorry, I'm back. <laughs> She's just appeared. Um, and yet, so I, you know, I think social media, I think there is a real argument about regulating social media in the same way that broadcasters are regulated. It seems like a no brainer, the kind of stuff that gets put out online, um, we'd never get away with. And uh, so I think that would, will help but it's going to take a while and there's going to be lots of battles and the big tech will no doubt um have lots to say about that so it'll be a while before it becomes a more benign environment and who knows whether the genie can ever be put back in the bottle mm -hmm. um julie i'm sure much of that uh, resonates with you as well i was wondering whether you're encouraged to keep a presence on social media and a bit about how it affects you and how you use it or don't use it well, I mean, I, the first thing I would say is that I would say that it is a whole sort of layer of, uh, of opportunity and stress that we didn't. Have. I mean, I've been a journalist for 30 years now, and it is something that, you know, is so recent, in, you know, that we now have to take on board and accommodate as part of our working lives. You know, and I, I just think it's 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 for those of us who've been around for a while, it's been quite a hard thing to adapt to. It obviously has its brilliant uses I'm the first one on it to check for breaking stories or the latest line or the latest you know it's like putting your finger and seeing which way the wind's blowing if you're following a wide enough range of people that you know that is obviously um you know and it is incredibly useful for that and yes you do try to reach out to people for stories and it you know it's sort of just you know what we'll work within now but the, the bottom line is that I know that for example um you know for example when I'm doing the debates um you just know you're going to get it's going to be an absolute barrage you know you, it, you it's something you have to now accommodate as part of the job is right okay how am I going to deal with it this time um and 
you know, events like that, you know, in all of the, and, you know, goodness knows they've been heated enough, haven't they, in the last few years, um, you know, that there's, it, it, it's so high octane around those debates that you just know that Twitter explodes at the slightest reason. Um, mm. So I actually, um, when I've done the debates, um, I've got a brilliant, I mean, I've, you know, it's a whole team of fantastic producers um, that work on that but you know um, I work with one producer in particular very closely and actually I just I just hand it to her and I just look look you somebody's got to keep an eye on it in case there is something that is genuinely dangerous to you in there mm. but actually I just now don't look at it in those in those those moments when you know that it's going to be it's going to be vile and it's not mm. all vile some people are kind enough to say nice things you know but um, I, I sort of spare myself that now and and actually on those big big moments where you know there's a lot of attention a lot of heat um, I you know I'm very fortunate that um, you know I have a producer that keeps an eye on it for me but I mean you know that's the sign of the times isn't it that you have to do that to be able to keep your focus I'm not very thick-skinned actually I do it does get to you um, it gets to me um, and I suppose I've, I've become a, a little better at dealing with it but I wouldn't say a great deal. Julie you know, just that you know, I find it really hard. Julie, I was just going to say when, when you were saying it's not all vile. I remember when I did um, the book, Bloody Brilliant Women, um, someone just tweeted me and said, um, when I look at you, I see the devil looking back. <laughs> and then <laughs> saw the, saw the, somebody else tweeted, should have gone to Specsavers. <laughs> I, I get so much hate. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable to the point I laugh now. I actually have a rule when I do my five live show because we get the texts coming in, which is equivalent. And we, we call for listeners to comment. And I have a rule which I put in the first day when I deputised for Emma Barnett because I took over from Emma Barnett, again, another bloody brilliant woman. Um, who and the producer said oh we're getting these nice texts in oh do you want to see and I just said I have a rule I don't want to see anything positive that's not related to the program and I don't want to see anything negative that's not related to the program and or to the subjects we're discussing because I find that although you you are absolutely focused and you intend to be absolutely focused if you are told oh yeah you're doing so well grilling this minister or pushing on this it can sway you intentionally or unintentionally it can sway you and if you stick to kind of what did we intend to do with this interview what did we intend to do with this story and you stay focused on that you ignore the people who are adding frivolous comments and unnecessary comments and that's just one way I try to protect myself and very similarly to Julie if I'm doing a minister interview or when I interviewed Boris Johnson I didn't look at anything afterwards because I knew our game plan I, I always know kind of what I intend to do and once you start letting your ego either be fluffed or damaged, you change the nature of your job and it becomes about you and it's never, ever about you. I always see myself in a position of privilege that I am a facilitator to conversations um, and I am there to ask the questions that other people don't have the privileged position to be in, that I'm in, that Julie's in, that Kathy's in, that we're all in to ask questions to people we don't have access to every day, people don't have access to every day. Yeah. I think it's really interesting to reflect on both the positive and the negative side of social media and also the pressures of, of being in the public eye as you all are. I just wondered if we could pivot onto a slightly more positive side of the job and perhaps what are your greatest moments on air, whether that be the, you know, the privilege of speaking to people, like you say, Naga, who, who the, you know, average member of the public doesn't get to speak to, or whether it's reporting from certain locations, revealing things, um, scoops that you're particularly proud of. Um, I, can we start with you, Naga, if that's okay? Sure. Um, for me, this is going to sound really awful because it is a privilege to be able to talk to people uh, who are in power or are of influence. But mm -hmm. the joy of my jobs um, on Five Live and on Breakfast is I get to talk to people who are everyday people who have had extraordinary things happen to them. And it could be a World War II veteran in Caen when I was doing the D-Day um, uh, anniversaries. Um, and I just hear a story that I wouldn't have been privy to and no one else would have been privy to. And when they open up to you, um, it could be a parent whose 
young boy, and this still touches me, is sitting on the breakfast sofa who is dying of cancer. And they are uh, working tirelessly to raise awareness about a certain cancer or raise money or raise funds to help others and knowing, and we'd all been told we couldn't tell, we couldn't mention death in front of this boy because he was, he had a terminal um, illness. And to be, to, for people to allow you to touch their lives and help them tell their story of something that is so personal and so precious and often so painful, those are the things that really stick with me. And they are a privilege. And those are the things that I take away that, don't always bring joy because of the subject matter, but I'm proud. I am very proud that I am in a position of that privilege um, and that people trust us enough to mm. let us help them tell their story. Uh, and that for me is the joy of the job. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, I guess same, same question to you, Kathy and Julie about but, you know what are your sort of greatest moments on the job I mean so similarly to Naga um that sounds like an incredible interview with the the boy um there was a guy called Tony Nicklinson who was campaigning for the right to die and he was paralyzed from the neck downwards and he couldn't speak or feed himself and he wanted to be able to end his life at a time of his choosing without fear of his wife being prosecuted and the only way he could do the interview was by blinking at the letters on a board and she would sort of point to the letters and we'd spell out the letters of every word and form sentences and you know obviously you can imagine the interview took forever but I just felt so privileged to be able to tell his story and he was so determined to have his voice heard um because he literally couldn't speak any other way. Um, and then by the end of the interview, which took hours, we were both in tears because it was just such an emotional experience. So that was an incredible privilege. But also, you know, I've loved, um, I went to Moscow to interview Sergei Lavrov, the foreign minister, Russian foreign minister. And, you know, the, he's such a kind of wily operator. That was just, it was just so, it's such fun sort of gaming the interview and sort of working out where he was going to go with it. It was a real challenge. And then Max Mosley, the former Formula One boss, who's now died. We had a scoop about him in this racist leaflet he put out years ago in an election campaign. And I remember sort of like confronting him with the leaflet in the middle of the show. And it was a live interview. It was really stressful because I knew he was incredibly litigious. So if I put a foot wrong, you know, it could be curtains for, for me and for probably for the news as well. So it was very stressful, but it was just, again, incredibly um, exhilarating doing an interview with him. So that was brilliant. And I loved, um, you know, I love doing, I love working with the investigations team on the, you were talking about Simon Harris, the a British paedophile who abused all these Kenyan street boys. And actually, because of the investigation we did, he was jailed for 12 years. And also John Smythe, who was a friend of the Archbishop, he beat these um, boys and young men in the name of Jesus. And we did an investigation revealing what had happened, you know, decades later. And so that felt that was an incredible privilege to be able to tell their story, which had lain buried for decades. And the people in the church associated with the church knew all about it. They had a report spelling it all out in black and white and they'd never tried to get justice for these um, victims, these survivors. So that was an incredible honor too. So I do feel like, like I said, a real privilege to be able to, to do what we do and to tell the stories of people who otherwise wouldn't get their, their stories and voices heard. Thanks, Kathy. Examples there of sort of where journalism can very obviously make such a, a big difference to, to people's lives. Um, Julie, is, is there anything that stands out for you as, as being sort of a, a great achievement? Um, well, you know, it, it's, I mean, it, it is a huge privilege of this job that you are there, you know, in that sort of, you know, time warm phrase, you know, you, you, you're there, you get a ringside seat at some of the, you know, great sort of moments in history, really, um, whether it's big national events or, you know, I was in, um, I was in Rockefeller, Plaza in New York on the night um, 
the night that Obama was first elected and then went to Chicago, you know, didn't didn't sleep that night, got on the plane overnight to Chicago where he'd just done his first speech as the new president, you know, and that was obviously just the most extraordinary moment for America. And it was in, incredible to be caught up in all of that and working on that as a journalist was amazing. But, you know, I mean, I often think back to, to the work that, um, you know, we the team did on Newsround um, and, you know, you know, I was out, at, you know, doing a film with the children of the new South Africa in Soweto in the year that President Mandela was, you know, he was inaugurated um, and being in Bosnia at the end of the war and speaking to kids. And it's one of those things that, you know, I mean, it's I think things are so different now because I think kids engage with social media and are just much more savvy in talking to camera and sharing stories. But, you know, back then in the early 90s um, and in the, in the wake of the Bosnian War, and, you know, and, and I say that um, being very conscious of the fact that we're here speaking, you know, um, with the John Schofield Trust and, uh, you know, reflecting on that deeply, as I say it, but just hearing children's voices at the end of the Bosnian War um, about what they suffered in Mostar, for example. They were absolutely brilliant, articulate, amazing kids. Um, and I went back um, to Mostar a couple of years ago to, to catch up with them. Um, we did a piece for the On Assignment strand that ITV uh, makes as well. And I said to them, look, I'd love to go back and see if we could find some of these kids that we interviewed at the end of the war. And we found them, you know, and that is great producers. That's great producers as well, tracking mm -hmm. them down. And to go back to Mostar and meet up with, with you know, these you know, we'd, we'd interviewed two little girls uh, in a music school um, and we got shots of them sitting with their legs dangling at the piano playing together. And we we found them as grown music teachers all these years on. And sometimes just, you know, having the privilege of seeing a story come full circle and, and still being able to go back to people and, and, you know, amplify those stories. You know, it's just incredible, you know. Um, so, there, you know, I mean, there are some amazing moments. And then, you know, Theresa, t Theresa May tells me what the naughtiest thing she ever did <laughs> was. <laughs> and, you get, and you get a little moment then that, that takes on a life of its own, you know. Um, so lots, lots of incredible experiences, really. Um, but, you know, always a great privilege to do it. It's interesting there, Julie, that you draw upon the whole team effort and the fact that it's often mm. a you know a team of producers who help with the the bigger piece stories and the tracking down the the kids as, as you said um ju just to pivot from that there's a question from amy who asks or she says she really appreciates hearing about all the preparations that go into interviews but have there been moments when you have been caught off guard when something has surprised you in the middle of a broadcast um, and you don't quite know how to to respond to it. Um, sh shall I start with you, Nagar, on that one? Yeah, I I mean, things surprise us all the time. I mean, Kathy, Julie, we're all familiar with breaking news. Um, and breaking news is sometimes something you are absolutely not expecting. I remember um, breaking the capture of Saddam Hussein and it had been rumoured and rumoured and rumoured and we had no idea in breaking that. And I think with it all is you can only draw on your knowledge um always be curious so I've just got into Manchester tonight my alarm's going off at quarter to four in the morning but I will do a couple of hours of reading watching um watching news catching up just so I have an idea of what's going on in the world still obviously I've been at work today as well so I, I, I kind of feel fairly prepared and we'll get our briefing notes um when I think you have to remember as a presenter your role and particularly for breakfast, actually, um, particularly over the last 18 months. People have used breakfast. Breakfast has done really well because people have wanted stability. They've wanted information and they've wanted stability. And uh, we've done really well in terms of viewership because we became more habitual. Breakfast tends to be a, a habitual viewing. I mean, it's, it's all bulletins you have in your, your routine, but more people started turning to breakfast and seeing us as a reassuring presence. And I've always known that we're supposed to be, but whenever anything does happen, breaking news or developing story or scary story, and we've all, all of all three of us, I'm sure, you know, have played parts in various um, reporting roles for the terror attacks that we've experienced in, in, in recent years. Um, for me, it's be calm, 
only say what we know. Don't be afraid to repeat what we know because it's new to everyone. And reassure the viewer that we're only going to tell you what we know. We're not going to speculate because we're, we're not there. But we will, and we will be there to get the most informed voices we can to keep you informed. But it's always calm and reassured. The moment you show that you're, and it's like, I can't remember who said it, you know, often you, you are swimming like ferociously underwater, your legs are going, but you're keeping that swan-like appearance. Um, so for me, yes, things take, us, take, take me by surprise. Of course they do. But the job is not to show my surprise. The job is to keep informing and in as measured a manner and even handed a manner as possible. Mm -hmm. Almost sounds as if I'm being cold, but I, in some ways you have to be. Yeah. Uh, Julie, Julie, Kathy, I guess maybe similar thoughts to Naga, but have there been situations, whether in big breaking events or, or other things unexpected where you've been caught off guard? Um, do you, do you, I'll after you, Julie. Well, no, I mean, it is really just to pick up on some of the areas around breaking news. I mean, when I was at Sky News, obviously that's, you know, that's where rolling news channels really sort of come into their own. And, um, you know, it's not just being prepared journalistically, it's being prepared uh, in getting your tone right as, as facts start to come in. And I think that's a really important element. And it really sits alongside what Naga was saying about you just keep calm, keep the tone right. You know, you've got to be really conscious. I, I was on air, um, well, when 7-7 happened. And um, for those of you who remember the early hours of that appalling event, you know, there was this, there was so much speculation in the early hours about whether this, this was some sort of electrical fault, whether there was some sort of power outage. And it was really, you know, it was, um, we, we were really in, you know, really trying to navigate something that it took a while for the facts to start emerging. Um, and I, I went on air with that story and we still didn't know that it was a, it was a terrorist attack when we went on air. And then bit by bit, we started getting the facts coming through. And that is the moment when you are, you realise that there are, there will be people tuning in to watch what's unfolding who may be thinking, I need to know what is happening because I know that my loved one left the house this morning to go to work on that tube line or whatever, you know, so it is a real, you know, you've got to keep this really sort of analytical head on at the time and, and take people through the story as you know it, but always be aware that what you're dealing with here is, you know, utter tragedy. So your tone you, you know, you've got to watch your tone the whole of the way through it. Um, and, you know, we were on air, you know, for hours and hours that day and things sort of, it was just this unfolding horror. Um, and, you know, I, I often I often reflect on that day, actually, and just think, you know, for, for, for a newsroom to sort of completely re-gear around this enormous story, everything else you sort of ceases to matter and you are just, the whole operation turns its attention to that. And, and you have to sort of sit in this calm space and navigate it. Um, you know, it's, it's it, it, you know, that th those are the most testing days by, by a long way, really. Um, uh, and, you know, um, again, it's a, it's a privilege to do that job, but there's a lot of, lot of responsibility in those hours, I think. Yeah, I, I remember um, the day Prince Philip died. Um, I was on Times Radio and I remember when you were talking about tone, Julie, um, Giles Corrin's show was on air, which is all about sort of like cooking and it's all quite jaunty. So they like instantly got him out of the studio and I had to go in very rapidly. And again, I was very aware with that, that, you know, you've got a kind of, it wasn't, you know, he was very elderly, obviously it wasn't entirely unexpected, but even so you've got to sort of be thinking about tone the whole way through um, and that was yeah not, not nowhere near like the 9-11 uh, in terms of duration but I was supposed to be on air for three hours and I ended up being on air for about six I think so that was interesting and the other thing which actually answers another question that's popped up about so you were asking about unexpected events um, it's a funny story really um, someone else was asking a question about what happens when people don't answer your questions like politicians and so on which is infuriating but sometimes when people do unexpectedly answer your questions it's quite discombobulating so I was doing an interview with um, George Obama who brother of the more famous Barack I knew he was quite wild but I kind of wanted to know how wild. So I asked Julie's question, which she put to Theresa May, what's the naughtiest thing you've ever done? He said, 
really immediately and really rapidly before I had time to gather my thoughts. He said, oh, armed robbery. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Didn't quite know where to go with that. So when they do answer the question, it can be even tougher than when they don't. I just wanted to pick up on a couple of things, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, when Cathy was of um, Prince Philip, um, when that broke, we we were all prepared, as most newsrooms are, we do obit, we call them obit rehearsals, um, and we, we go through these scenarios because we're so aware of the tone, as Julie was saying. And with Prince Philip, one of the things that we really had to be mindful of was this was happening in a pandemic where so many people had lost family members through extraordinary circumstances. And we had to be really mindful of tone in the sense that, yes, this was a figurehead, of you know in Britain but so many people had lost grandparents and loved ones and it was it was a really difficult balancing act and I'm, I'm kind of moving away from the kind of the original question but it was a really difficult balancing act between this is very sad for the UK and you know the monarchy but actually other people had been through this especially when we covered the funeral as well and there was the whole tone about look at the Queen she's sitting on her own but there had been so many families who'd done that. So we had to be very mindful of that as well. And I just wanted to pick up on what Julie said about 9-11. I was a producer when 9-11 happened. Um, and when 7-7 and and when happened, I was at Channel 4 and I was a producer and I was sent out to go and get pictures and talk to people. But I remember when Grenfell broke and I was on breakfast and it started in the night and people were waking up to it. And I remember the thing that took me about, took me, really, really shocked me is Charlie and I were sitting there, Charlie State, my co-presenter, and with memories of 9-11, we were petrified that we were going to, because you take all these live feeds, all these pictures, these live pictures coming through, and you do, you don't wait for a delay often, you, you take them as they're coming in from all the news agencies, and we were petrified, we were hearing tales of people who had family members in that building, and both of us, because of our experience, remembered the pictures from 9-11 of people throwing themselves out of the building. Yeah. And we were preparing ourselves for images like that. And that, I think, you, you, you then have to go back to basics. As Julie said, you, are, you, you know, we're in positions of trust and staying calm, but also thinking, when I was hearing from family members who were worried about that and saying that on air, holding my own emotions in, because we're humans at the end of the day, we have families, you know, there are children and, and loved ones. And just knowing that someone's experiencing that pain, that is very difficult to kind of be that voice of almost authority and calm when you yourself are human and experiencing this fear as well. Yeah, I guess it's about holding on to those sort of fundamentals of journalism and being a human being, even in the most sort of stressful of situations. Um, I'm aware we're, we're relatively short on time. So I just want to, it's obviously a key part of the John, Field, John Schofield Trust is promoting diversity in newsrooms. I know you each have been champions of diversity in newsrooms in different ways. I wondered whether you feel the situation is improving, has improved, how far we've got to go in terms of diversity in different roles. Um, I don't know who wants to pick up first. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to um, pick up on that, that I think it was last month, anyway, not long ago, Channel 4's Black to Front initiative, I thought was really amazing. I'd be interested to know what, what Naga thought of it, but- um, I thought it was what I excellent. Thought... <laughs> I thought it was excellent. I thought it was, sorry, Cathy, I interrupted. I thought it was absolutely brave, brilliant. Um, it's been said before, it's something that should have been done a long time ago and Channel mm. 4 is pivotal in bringing, yeah. in just so, saying, and excuse my language, screw this, we're going to show you how this looks, how this should look, we're going to do what we need to do. And Channel 4 has been great, like that. I thought it was brilliant. Oh, thank you, thank you. I mean, what I thought was amazing as well was that all of the people who fronted our show that night were drawn from within the newsroom and I thought that was excellent, you know, that we didn't have to sort of hire in... Um, new people the diversity is there but I still think there's a lot to be improved on and I think the key area is now actually probably class really and that is that um, diversity of background that I think we all need to work on you know it's still too sort of um, 
monothematic in terms of people's backgrounds and socioeconomic backgrounds in particular. But I think otherwise, I think strides have been made and we can't stop now. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would say uh, at ICTV News too, for sure. Um, I, didn't, I had a bit of a, a Wi-Fi freeze there, so I didn't quite catch what Cathy was saying. But um, for those, in, I mean, we take it really seriously. We don't get it right all the time, but we have an audit of every single one of our programmes um, to work out the male-female balance, um, in terms of representation of, um, you know, uh, 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 diversity, we have a, a, an audit done on that, but I would absolutely echo the point that it is socio-economic diversity, class background, um, that is the, is the nut that we've still got to crack. I think there's still work to be done on all of those fronts, but I think that is the one. It, access to news, um, and I know this is one of the areas that, um, John Schofield Trust put so much, um, you know, valuable uh, uh, emphasis on, but access to news and working in journalism from people from a range of different backgrounds um, is, is absolutely key to getting better newsrooms, I think. I completely agree. I think, I, I mean, I agree with both um, Cathy and Julie. Colour color was the easier one to kind of pick up and say, there's not enough diversity, but class and socioeconomic background and diversity of thought is what's so needed. I noticed one of the questions I was just looking was um, something along the lines of um, a non, someone from a non-journalist background successfully entering the field. Would an outsider's perspective be seen as an advantage and disadvantage? Um, one of the things I think that has improved is that newsrooms are becoming more open to the fact that we're all different and we don't have to fit into this mold of what does a newsreader look like? What does a journalist look like? Where have they gone to university? What have they done? Have they done a postgrad? If you have confidence in the fact that you are unique, obviously, and what you are bringing is a personal experience. And if you tap into that, and this is the advice I often give to young, young journalists or people who want to be journalists, Kathy, Julie and I, we're all 40 and above. Um, we have no idea, even whether they're, their children are, are, are of a younger age as well, we still have no idea what it's like to be 20 something today. And you are bringing that, and you are bringing your upbringing, you are bringing your background, um, and you are offering that perspective and never underestimate that that is what you're, you're gonna bring to and bring and diversify in a newsroom. Because there is a layer, there is a layer of this Oxbridge, um, you know, top five uni, red brick unis and, you know, a certain social group that they, they're all very comfortable together and they need prodding and they need, walls need literally kicking down. And you can do that but just by saying, but no one's talking about this. You all think that we're talking about this. No one's talking about that. We all think this is boring. And actually this is the bigger problem. Speak up and know that you are bringing something different that we have no idea about. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. That's absolutely Fascinating to get all your your thoughts on what is such an important issue in our newsrooms, both in terms of visibility, but also in terms of telling the stories in the best possible way. It's best to have the the you know broadest range of, of opinions and thoughts. Um, I'm aware you're all very busy, so just one final question. Um, and this, I'm not sure. Oh, this this comes from Noah. Um, he says. Who would you still like to interview? Is there anyone remaining that you would uh, like to get your claws in for or just like to have a chat with? Vladimir Putin. <laughs> I, I've got to have a sit down with Trump. <laughs> <laughs> He's yesterday's man. Oh, he might be tomorrow's man. Never know. <laughs> Who would, who would I like to go? I mean, I think um, just, you know, I, I mean, it, it, just two of the, the, the key names swiftly pinched there by my uh, lovely colleagues on this. But, you know, Her Majesty the Queen, I think it's, yes. you know, there, there are three key, three key players there, you know. Um, never going to happen, Julie. It's never going to happen. <laughs> no, no, no. But no. if she does it with anyone, she'll do it with you. <laughs> I'm keeping the naughty question. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm sure everyone hopes that all of those interview uh, wish lists will come off. Um, I just want to say a massive, massive thank you. It's been a real privilege um, for me to hear from, from you as well. And I'm sure everyone who's, who's 
tuned in, um, whether they're sort of John Schofield Trust mentees or otherwise, um, will have been thoroughly engaged and uh, fascinated to hear your thoughts on a broad range of subjects. So thank you ever so much. Actually, just finally, before we go, one very, very last question for Naga. It's from Ian. Um, and he says, who does Naga think will star for Europe in the Ryder Cup? <laughs> Fan question. Who do I think will what? Star for Europe in the Ryder Cup. Oh, it's the rookie. It's the rookie, isn't it? It's got to be the rookie. I can't remember his name, but it's going to be it's going to be the rookie, and um, we're going to win. We're going to retain it. Sorry, and um, my weekend is completely planned around it, so I, I'm literally living for the weekend. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, you heard it here first. Thank you ever so much, ladies, and thank you for everyone who tuned in as well. And thanks for the John Schofield Trust for for arranging it. And thank you, thank Martha. You. Thank you, Martha. You're doing a brilliant thank job. You. Thank you.